Hi. Good to Hi. meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, I'm Maria. I'm going to be hosting the talk today. Excellent. And I think I heard the former president of the society. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I started the society in um, October 2019 and then mm. handed over to the committee last year. Where are you now? Um, I'm still at Oxford. I'm in Gladke Bedwell's group. There you go. Okay. Um, I spent yeah. some time with them during my PhD. I spent some time as a visiting researcher there. It's, at least right. I, I imagine that people have changed out, but at least then it had a nice atmosphere. It's very friendly. Yeah, it's a nice group. How long were you there for? I was there for an autumn. Oh. I was working with Vladko, Oscar Dalston, and Andy Gardner, who are now spread out. Yeah, I think I've heard, heard the names around, but um, yeah, the, the group will have changed. Mm -hmm. So should I share my talk? Uh, yeah, you can share the slides and then we can um, wait a few minutes to start. What's the um, what's the image you have in your background of your um, Zoom? That is a, a sculpture of a quantum steampunk engine. So I was approached last year by a steampunk artist who asked if I would like to collaborate on a quantum steampunk sculpture after he saw one of my talks. Um, I had never done anything like that before, but it was a lot of fun. So we came up with this design. Now at the center is a trapped ion um, quantum engine. And the part outside has, as you can see here, a classical engine on it. So that classical and quantum are supposed to interact in the sculpture. We are oh. still looking for funders. So if anyone in the audience is interested in contributing to a quantum steampunk sculpture, then they can feel free to get in touch. But it was fun to see the, at least the concepts of the sculpture emerge and work with the artists. Oh, yeah, that sounds cool. Would the sculpture be, how big would it be? Depends on how much funding is available. So uh, the, Full scale results uh, could be something that you know, stands on its own, say outdoors somewhere that people could actually walk around and it would be interactive. A uh, smaller version would be tabletop size. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's um, fun when there's like art projects linking to the physics can get some different people engaged with it that might yes. not normally um, interact with the physics. Yes. Cool. Um, well, it's six o'clock now. Um, I think we still have people coming in, but um, we could make a start. Um, so to introduce our speaker today, we've got Nicole Younger Halpin, who is a postdoctoral fellow at um, Harvard, and. Um, but later this year, she's going to be a physicist at the National Institute of Science and Technology and a fellow at the Joint Institute for Quantum Information and Computer Science and an affiliate at the Joint Quantum Institute and an adjunct professor of physics at the University of Maryland. And Nicole did her physics PhD with um, John Preskill and that finished in 2018. And last year, she also um, was awarded the International Quantum Technology Emerging Researcher Award from the Institute of Physics. So we're um, really pleased that Nicole could um, come and give a talk for the Quantum Information Society. And I'm looking forward to hearing about quantum steampunk. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks very much for the invitation. And thanks to everybody who's taking some time to come listen about quantum, quantum thermodynamics. So I'd like to start with a technical term that is steampunk. So steampunk is a genre of literature, art, and film. Set in the late 19th century, it encompasses all of the romanticism of the Victorian era, 
then cranks up the technological level to 11. Steampunk works feature old settings from the Victorian era, you know, some of the newest factories, men in top hats, women in skirts, together with futuristic technologies like time machines, airships, and robots. People dress up in steampunk costumes and go to steampunk conventions because there's this wonderful sense of adventure and romanticism that comes from blending this old setting with the new technology. I tend to say these people dream it, quantum information thermodynamicists live it. So let me break down that term. Thermodynamics is a branch of physics and chemistry that was developed during the 1800s, namely the steampunk era. It was originally motivated by technology. People wanted to understand how efficiently an engine could pump water out of mines. But the technological questions ended up motivating fundamental physics questions like why does time flow in only one direction? Thermodynamics was developed to describe the cutting edge technology of the day, the steam engine, so a large classical system. Today's cutting edge technologies look a little bit different. So I see that there are some comments in the chat. Yeah, I'm not sure what your usual format is for this talk. Should I take questions during the talk or leave them till later? Um, I think in general, we can do questions at the end, but I'll monitor the chat. And if there's something that looks particularly relevant to drop in at a certain time, then maybe I can then um, bring attention to it. Okay, thanks. Today, a lot of very interesting experiments and technologies involve small scales. For instance, this is a strand of DNA. You can trap one end of it in an optical trap and use optical tweezers to stretch the strand. Then you can measure the work required to stretch the strand through a given distance. Of course, a lot of the technologies that we're most interested in are quantum. For instance, this is the fridge in which I think this is one of the IBM quantum computers, versions of the quantum computer is being cooled down. And cooling is a thermodynamic process. Associated with the computing is information processing. Often we're interested in settings that involve information processing, and we might want to know about the relationship between energy and information. Finally, a lot of very interesting experiments nowadays are happening far from equilibrium. Apart from you and me, we as living beings are far from equilibrium. But in the quantum realm, for example, we are now, we have a bunch of quantum many body systems, we poke them out of equilibrium, and we see how perturbations and information spread across the system. These settings are all very different from the old classical thermodynamic setting that we talked about. But thermodynamic concepts like work, heat, and efficiency are still relevant. So we need a toolkit for revitalizing thermodynamics, reimagining it for the 21st century. Quantum information theory provides such a toolkit. I imagine that a lot of people here know what I mean by quantum information theory, but to ensure that we're all on the same page. By quantum information theory, I mean the study of how quantum phenomena how we can use quantum phenomena to process information in ways impossible for classical systems like today's well, most of today's computers. By process information, I mean solve computational problems, communicate information, secure information cryptographically, and store information. By quantum phenomena, I mean a number of things. Entanglement, the non-commutation of operators, the discreteness of spectra, and how a measurement can disturb a quantum system and more. Now, of course, we can talk about the degree to which these various properties are non-classical or more classical, but they are all associated with quantum systems. Quantum information theory, like thermodynamics, has, at least in part, been motivated by the promise of technology, such as quantum computers. But since that motivation has partially goaded people into developing this field of quantum information theory, now we have a wonderful mathematical and conceptual toolkit that's being applied to many different spheres of science in order to provide new perspectives. So quantum information theory is being applied to computer science, condensed matter, high energy physics and black hole physics, chemistry, and thermodynamics. If you take the thermodynamics of the 1800s and update it for the 21st century with quantum information, and you get this fusion of old and new that I call 
quantum steampunk. Here's where I'd like to go in the rest of this talk. First, I'd like to convince you that it makes some sense to put together quantum information theory and thermodynamics. Then I'll show that work and information can be resources in both thermodynamics and information processing. Then I'll give an example of a field that's under active work in quantum thermodynamics today, that of quantum many-body engines, and I'll present a quantum many-body engine based on a particular phase of quantum matter. Finally, I'll talk about the opportunities in this field. Why does it make sense to combine quantum information theory with thermodynamics? Oh, first, about this photo here. Uh, while I was making this talk, I peppered the talk with a whole bunch of steampunk artwork. Uh, so if anyone here does not like steam, the steampunk aesthetic, then I apologize, but hopefully at least the art will keep you awake. The big question asked in information theory is, how efficiently can we process information? The answer I like to call the liver of information theory. When I was 14, I took a biology class with a teacher who said, if anyone in this class ever does not know the answer to a question on a test of mine, you should write down liver. So the liver performs some ridiculous number of functions in the human body. So if you ever don't know the answer to a biology question and you write down liver, you have an anomalously high probability of being correct. Similarly, if anyone asks you, what is the optimal efficiency with which we can perform some information processing task? And you answer a function of an entropy, you have an anomalously high probability of being correct. An entropy is a function of a probability distribution or a quantum state. It quantifies the uncertainty about the outcome of the measurement or the value of a random variable distributed according to this probability distribution. To progress farther, I'd like to provide a little bit of background about qubits. This will be review information to some people. It might be more new to other people. The qubit is the basic unit of quantum information. It's the quantum version of the bits, which is the basic unit of classical information. A bit is something that can be in one of two possible states, left or right, or zero or one. Qubits manifest physically as quantum two-level systems. One of the favorite examples is the spin of a particle that has a spin quantum number of one half. And a favorite example of that is the electron. We represent qubit states with very often this symbol rho. Rho is represents a density operator, which you can think of as a matrix relative to your favorite basis. Technically, it's a trace one positive semi-definite linear operator, which just means that well, the trace one means that if you measure the states, then you'll get some outcome. And the positive semi-definite means that if you take this matrix and you calculate its eigenvalues, you'll find that they're all real and at least zero. We represent qubit states with points on or in the Bloch sphere. A particularly simple set of states consists of the pure states. These are represented by simple outer products. This ket here denotes a vector in Hilbert space. That's represented by an arrow that goes from the center of the Bloch sphere all the way to the surface of the sphere. This arrow pointing upward represents the quantum analog of the zero bit. The downward pointing arrow represents the quantum analog of the one bit. And a qubit is not constrained to be just zero or one, so it can point anywhere on the sphere. Other states are mixed states. These can't be expressed as just kets or as just outer products. A mixed state is the state of a system that's entangled with some other quantum system. It's represented by an arrow that doesn't go all the way out to the surface of the Bloch sphere. And the shorter the arrow, the more entangled our system is with another system. One favorite example in thermodynamics of a mixed state is the thermal state. This exponential is the form of the states. We're looking at some system that's governed by some Hamiltonian H. Beta is the inverse temperature, and Z is the partition function, which normalizes the state. Now we can 
meet an entropy face to face. So let's see that an entropy does serve as the optimal efficiency with which we can perform some information processing task. Suppose that I have a message that I would like to send to a friend. We agree in advance on which message I might send. I can send some letter. I might send A or B or C and so on. My friend knows the probability that I'll send A and the probability that I'll send B, but not exactly which letter I'll send. From my friend's perspective, I'm sending a mixed quantum state in which the possible letters are weighted by their probabilities. Suppose for mathematical convenience that I send many, many, many copies of this message. I am sending this tensor product state. Suppose that I want to condense my message. I want to squeeze it into as few qubits, basic units of quantum information as possible. So how many qubits do I need? I'm performing the information processing task of data compression. The answer is given to us by Schumacher's theorem. It states that in the limit, as the number of copies of my message approaches infinity, the number of qubits I need per copy of my message equals this function, the von Neumann entropy of my state, the negative of the trace of rho times log rho. This entropy quantifies my friend's average over copies, uncertainty about which message I'm sending. So we've seen that an entropy is useful in an information processing task, but why is this thing called an entropy? The answer is told to us by Shannon. Claude Shannon founded information theory in the early 20th century. This is a Google doodle from a few years ago. So Shannon told us that he talked to his friend, John von Neumann, the great Hungarian American mathematician and physicist. And von Neumann said, you should call it entropy for two reasons. In the first place, your uncertainty function has been used in statistical mechanics under that name, so it already has a name. In the second place, and more important, no one knows what entropy really is, so in a debate you will always have the advantage. That is why I personally do quantum information theory and thermodynamics. But indeed, here is the fundamental relation of statistical mechanics, and here is an entropy. In statistical mechanics, the entropy tells us how spread across phase space a probability distribution is. If we're dealing with a statistical mechanical system, we're dealing with a system of many, many particles, we don't know all of their positions and momenta. The best we can do is attribute to the system some probability density on phase space that says how likely the system is to be in this configuration or that configuration. And the entropy tells us something about how smeared across phase space this probability distribution is. So in statistical mechanics, as in information theory, an entropy quantifies an uncertainty. So I hope that I've convinced you that quantum information theory and thermodynamics share their spirit, but let's show that they can really be useful to each other. I'm going to argue that we can use information to turn heat into work. Information is a useful quantity in information processing. Heat and work belong to thermodynamics. So heat is useless energy. It's random. It's not being harnessed to accomplish anything. Work is energy that's in transit that is useful. It's being, it can be used to push a rock up a hill or charge a battery. This construction is called Szilard's engine. Uh, Szilard is he was another great Hungarian-American physicist of the 20th century. He said, imagine that we have a classical gas in a box, one of our favorite types of thought experiments as physicists. This classical gas in a box is going to be a very, very, very simple version of an ideal gas. Suppose that this gas can exchange heat through the walls of the box with a fixed temperature heat bath. And suppose that we begin with one bit of information about the particle. We know that the particle is on the right-hand side of the box rather than the left-hand side. We can slide a partition into the box, tie a rope to the partition, and tie an acme anvil to the rope, then unfix the partition so that it can slide. The particle is going to hit the partition. It's going to keep punching the partition until the partition gets to the other side of the box. At this point, we've raised the anvil. Anvil gains potential energy, so we've done work on it. We've taken 
random heat from the heat bath and turned it into useful work. How much work can we perform? Well, this type of work is pressure volume work because the gas is expanding. We know the form of the ideal gas law from high school class. We can solve for the pressure in terms of the volume and then substitute into our integral. Here I'm integrating from V over two to V because the gas begins confined to half the box, but ends up able to be anywhere in the whole box. We integrate, we evaluate the limits, and we find that we can perform an amount of work equal to Boltzmann's constant times the temperature of the heat bath times log two. So that's the work that we've performed. So we've gained work, but we no longer have a bit because we have no idea now where in the box the particle is. So we've traded information for work. We can reverse this process and perform Landauer erasure. Suppose that we start with a particle in a box and we have no idea where the particle is. We want to reset the particle to a well-defined position. This is like taking a messy sheet of scratch, scratch paper that you haven't really looked at closely, but you know that you want it clean. So you erase it, you reset it to a clean, well-defined initial state. We start with a lifted anvil. We hook up our contraction and we compress the gas. So we move the partition until it reaches the midway point of the box. Now we know that the particle is on the right-hand side, but because we were compressing a gas, we had to perform work. So we have returned to the bit to an unknown state by trading, excuse me, to a known state by trading work for information. This story is a simple story, but it has deep implications for the relationship between thermodynamics and computation. Suppose that you compute and compute and compute and compute. Eventually you're going to run out of scrap paper. So you have to take some old scrap paper and erase it. We've just seen that erasure costs thermodynamic work. So computation has an intrinsic thermodynamic work cost. When I first learned this, it blew my mind because who would have thought a priori that information and thermodynamics would be so closely intertwined? But it turns out that they are. I've been telling you a story about a classical gas in a box, but gosh darn it, this talk is called quantum steampunk. So how can we get quantumness into the picture? I'm gonna need to review a little bit more background about entanglement. Entanglement is a relationship that quantum particles can share. It manifests in correlations between outcomes of measurements. These correlations can be stronger than any that you can create with just classical particles. One of the most um, famous and widely used entangled states, and also one of the simplest entangled states, is the singlet state of two qubits. Very loosely speaking, either the first qubit is in the zero state while the second is in the one state, or the first qubit is in the one state while the second qubit is in the zero state. For instance, suppose that I share uh, a particle pair with Gandalf. Um, since I'm giving a talk at Oxford, I feel like I'm obliged to mention either C.S. Lewis or J.R.R. Tolkien. I chose J.R.R. Tolkien. So we're sharing entanglement with Gandalf. So I have particle A, Gandalf has particle B, and we can bring our particles together and perform some operation on them so that they become entangled. Then we can take our particles far apart. You know, Gandalf stays in Oxford. I go back to Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then we might want to measure our particles. Suppose that just Gandalf measures his system locally. We have no idea which outcome he'll obtain. Suppose, for instance, that we have spins and he measures the Z component of his spin. He has no idea whether he'll receive the up outcome or the down outcome. Now suppose that each of us measures a particle locally. There exists a measurement, or there's a family of measurements that we can perform such that we can predict something about the outcome. Suppose that we both measure along the same axis. Then if Gandalf receives the down outcome, I'll receive the up outcome. And if he receives the up outcome, I'll receive the down outcome. Furthermore, there exists a measurement that is a joint measurement of both qubits together, such that we can predict the outcome exactly. 
So there's something, some information that's not in one particle, it's not in the other particle, and it's not in the sum of two individual particles. It's in sort of the relationship between the particles. A synopsis for this is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Let's use entanglement in our erasure protocol. Suppose that we want to erase not a classical gas in a box, but a qubit that is entangled with some reference system, some memory. And again, we have around a heat bath that we can use to extract work. Turns out that we can erase the qubit while keeping the memory in its same reduced state while extracting net positive work. This outcome might be surprising. We just saw that erasure tends to cost positive work. The trick is to sort of burn the correlations between the system and memory and use the entanglement as something like a thermodynamic fuel. So in summary, we can use information to turn useless heat into useful work and information and work, including entanglement as quantum information, can serve as resources in both information processing and thermodynamics. Let's now switch gears. I did not intend that pun, sorry. Um, and start looking at a particular subfield of quantum thermodynamics that is under active investigation now. I'm going to present a quantum many body engine based on this phenomenon called many body localization, which is a phenomenon accessible to certain systems of many quantum particles. So many body localization is abbreviated as MBL. I usually do not use acronyms in my talks, but I'm going to need this acronym for a reason that we'll see later. MBL is a phase that some quantum many body systems can be in. One example is a chain of a bunch of qubits. That system can be governed by a Hamiltonian like the following. One term in the Hamiltonian has this sigma dot sigma form between nearest neighbors. This sigma dot sigma term encodes two pieces of physics. First, if one qubit points upward and its neighbor points downward, then the two can switch places. So the upwardness can hop over here and the downwardness can hop over here. Second, nearest neighbors repel each other. So that's one term. And the other term looks like this. It's called a disorder potential and it's, ex it's an external field. So this external field is disordered. It's very random, but varies a lot from site to site. We can create such a disorder potential, for example, with an optical lattice if our qubits are formed by ultra cold atoms. This external field we can think of as acting along the z direction. Again, it varies from site to site. So suppose that we are numerically simulating this Hamiltonian. So we can build the disorder potential as follows. Suppose that we want to figure out what the disorder potential should be at site j. We will randomly pick a number, h sub j, between negative one and one. Then we'll multiply it by the overall disorder strength, little h. If the disorder strength is much greater than the hopping frequency, then this system has the property that if you measure the particle's positions, the particles will approximately remain in those positions for a long time afterward. This behavior contrasts with the behavior of one of our favorite equilibrating systems. Again, the classical gas in a box. Suppose that we measure the positions of these particles and we find that the particles are clumped together in a corner. Very soon afterwards, the particles will be in very different positions. So in this way, and in another way that I'll mention shortly, many body, local, many body localized systems behave not at thermal equilibrium and not heading toward thermo, thermal equilibrium. Athermal systems can serve as resources in thermodynamic tasks like work extraction. We can see this through a simple example that we tend to come across in undergraduate statistical physics class. Suppose that we are in a temperature T sub H environment. So we have access to a giant temperature T sub H heat bath. And suddenly we're given a much colder system. We can let heat flow from one to the other and from the heat flow extract work. Work is valuable. For instance, we can use it to power our cars. So it makes sense to think that this system that is not at thermal equilibrium relative to the ambient temperature is a resource. 
can we use the athermality of many body localization as a resource in thermodynamic tasks? Well, of course the answer is yes, otherwise I would not have posted it in this talk. So we illustrated that the answer is yes in this paper by devising a quantum engine based on many body localization. And we call this engine the MBL mobile, which is why I had to introduce the acronym MBL. This is a quantum many body engine that can be in the many body localized phase or in a very different phase that's a lot more thermal. We defined an auto cycle for our MBL mobile. The auto cycle is the cycle that runs in our car engines. We defined a quantum variation on it. The engine cycle consists of four strokes. Two of those are isentropic, as you might remember from statistical mechanics class, isentropic means constant entropy. Two of the strokes are isochoric or constant volume. I can illustrate the engine cycle similarly to how we would illustrate any other engine cycle with a diagram. In conventional thermodynamics, I would draw a pressure volume diagram, but the pressure and the volume are not the properties of most relevance to this quantum system. So instead, along my axis, I will plot the strength of the disorder over the hopping frequency. And that occupies one of two regimes. If the disorder strength is much less, then the system is shallowly localized, or in an extreme version of this protocol, the system is actually in a whole different phase, a thermal phase. I can get technical if anybody wants during the question and answer session about what I mean by a thermal phase, but for our purposes now, it'll just mean that particles and information can spread out across the system quickly. If the disorder strength is much greater than the hopping frequency, then the system is deeply localized. Along the y-axis, I'll plot energies in the many-body Hamiltonian spectrum. The energies of our system have a property called energy gap statistics. When we're talking about quantum many-body systems, often we're not interested in just one particular Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian that I, showed you er that I showed you earlier had a bunch of random variables in it, h sub j. Different realizations of those random variables lead to different particular Hamiltonians within this class. So we'll think about a class of Hamiltonians and then we'll imagine randomly selecting one of the Hamiltonians from this class. We know if we head toward around the middle of the spectrum, we can find an energy level and right above that energy level is a gap. What is the probability that that gap is of size delta? That is the essential question within energy gap statistics. Energy gap statistics can vary drastically between phases. In particular, energy gap statistics vary between many body localization and the thermal phase. Again, if anybody wants details, then I can talk about what the energy gap statistics look like during the question and answer session. If the system is shallowly localized or in its thermal phase, well, let me restart that. The system, if it's in its shallowly localized regime, has energy level statistics that are not too far from the energy gap statistics of the actual thermal phase. There, the energies are somewhat evenly spaced. So every gap is usually not too far from the average gap, which I'll call average delta. I'll also assume for convenience that the average gap remains constant across the cycle. That's a condition that we can impose. If the system is in its deeply localized phase, then smaller gaps and larger gaps are more probable. We begin our engine cycle with the engine in its shallowly localized regime. It's in thermal equilibrium with a hot bath at a temperature T sub H. The system is in this quantum state. The density operator has a nice statistical interpretation. We can imagine that in each trial, the engine begins on one energy eigenstate. And after we perform our calculations for this one trial, we average over the energy eigenstates with a Boltzmann factor. We disconnect the system from the heat bath and during stroke one, tune the Hamiltonian from shallowly localized to deeply localized. In a simple initial approximation, we'll suppose that the tuning is quantum adiabatic. 
So if the system starts on the nth energy eigenlevel, it will always remain on the nth energy eigenlevel of the present Hamiltonian. That's a simple example, or excuse me, a simple initial assumption. After we go through that assumption, we can add on corrections due to diabatic hops between different energy levels. During this tuning, the energy of the system is moving downward. And the system is not connected to any heat bath. So the energy that's leaving the engine is not heat, it must be work. So our engine is performing a positive amount of work. And it ends stroke one here. During stroke two, the engine interacts with a cold bath at a temperature T sub H. We demand that the cold bath have a small bandwidth WB, a bandwidth much smaller than the average gap. Why? So that we select out these small gaps that occur more frequently in the deeply localized regime than in the shallowly localized regime because of how energy gap statistics differ between the two regimes. This cold bath can thermalize our engine down across the small gap, but not across the next gap because it's larger than the bandwidth. When the system drops downward, it outputs some amount of heats and it ends here. During stroke three, we tune our Hamiltonian back from deeply localized to shallowly localized. Again, the system's energy decreases, so the engine performs a positive amount of work. During stroke four, we reinitialize the engine by letting it thermalize with a hot bath. And that's our auto cycle. During this final step, heat goes into the engine. During our cycle, the engine performs a positive amount of work during each of the two tuning strokes. How come? Because the engine traverses this trapezoid whose narrow snout is in the deeply localized regime. We have ensured that we take advantage of this gap and we use only these small gaps that are more prevalent in the deeply localized regime than in the shallowly localized regime. That's why the engine moves downward in energy space during each of the tuning strokes. So we take advantage of how the energy gap statistics of many body localization differ from the energy gap statistics of the thermal regime. So we could say that the energy gap statistics of a many body localized system are athermal. They are not as in the thermal regime. And we take advantage of that athermality to run our MBL auto cycle you might be worried that something goes wrong. Let n denote the number of sites in our engine. The size of the energy band of our system is extensive, but the number of energy levels in the band grows exponentially. So the average gap, which is like the energy band over the number of gaps, and which is also greater than the average work outputted from any one cycle, because each cycle is confined to one of those trapezoids that's confined by the size of a gap, that approaches zero in the thermodynamic limit. So it looks as though in the thermodynamic limit, as our engine gets very, very large, it outputs on average no work, which is not very useful. We can avoid this problem by taking advantage of the other athermal property of many body localization, namely localization. Particles don't really go anywhere. Suppose that we take our big engine and break it up into smaller mesoscale sub-engines. Each sub-engine will contain about 10 sites. The power or the average work outputted per cycle is going to be exponentially small in just this constant, not in the whole system size. So we put a bunch of mesoscale sub-engines together. The power grows linearly with the number of sub-engines, so it actually grows linearly as the total number of sites in the engine, instead of decreasing exponentially with the total number of sites in the engine. Furthermore, many body localized systems are localized. So the particles over here are not really going to stray into this mesoscale sub-engine and interfere with this mesoscale sub-engine. So we can pack the sub-engines relatively close together and achieve a high power density. And that's because, again, what happens in a sub-engine tends to stay in a sub-engine. We can take advantage of the localization property 
of many body localization in order to scale up our engine toward the thermodynamic limit. When we evaluate an engine, we calculate its power and its efficiency. We can do that for our MBL mobile. We found that the average work outputted per cycle scales again linearly in the total number of particles, which is like the total number of sub engines, and also like the cold baths bandwidth. There are some corrections because our baths might not be ideal, our cold bath might not be at zero temperature, our hot bath might not be at infinite temperature, and we can't actually tune a Hamiltonian infinitely slowly. So when we're tuning the Hamiltonian, the engine won't necessarily stay on its current energy level, it might hop to another level. But on the whole, we get out a positive amount of work on average. So this is just some abstract expression, but we can come up with an order of magnitude estimate. We considered an, a localized engine formed from silicon doped with phosphorus. This system hasn't actually yet been used to realize many body localization. It's been used to realize a different sort of localization, but we can use it for our order of magnitude estimate. According to our estimates, our engine operates at a power of about 10 to the negative 16 watts. And what does that mean? It's about 10 times the power, according to our estimates, of another small motor, the motor that powers the flagellum of a bacterium. We can also calculate the power per unit volume. We expect it's about 100 kilowatt hours per meter cubed. What does that mean? It's about one tenth of the power density of a car engine car. So we are not going to find many body localized engines in our garages anytime soon, but you know, the system doesn't perform too badly. We backed up these analytics with numerical simulations. We simulated a chain of 12 qubits using exact diagonalization. This was our prediction for the average work output. It should scale like the cold baths bandwidth. And we find that scaling on the x-axis is the cold bath bandwidth. On the y-axis is the average work outputted. The blue line is the theoretical prediction. And it's ma it matches very well to the red dots, which come from the numerical simulations. This is the regime, the parameter regime, in which we expect our predictions really to work. But they hold quite well outside of that regime, too. We should also calculate the efficiency. The efficiency of an engine is defined as the work outputted, the network outputted, over the heat absorbed during the step in which the engine on average absorbs a positive amount of heat. That turns out to be one minus the cold bath bandwidth over twice the average gap. We said that we were assuming that the cold bath bandwidth is much less than the average gap. So this correction is small and the efficiency can be quite close to one. We should compare this quantum engine's efficiency with the engine of the ordinary auto engine, that of an ideal gas. If we run an ideal gas engine through an auto cycle, then we compress and expand the gas between two different volumes, V minus and V plus. Cp and Cv denote the heat capacities of the gas at constant pressure and constant volume. These two expressions can equal each other. Suppose that I am a conventional thermodynamic agent. I have an ideal gas heat engine that I'm running in an auto cycle. I measure my heat capacities. I choose volumes between which to compress and expand. And ideally, I can operate my engine with this efficiency. Then suppose that Gandalf is operating a many body localized auto engine. So I hand my numbers off to Gandalf. He can choose a cold bath bandwidth and an average gap such that his engine ideally operates at the same efficiency as mine. Both these efficiencies are no greater than the Carnot efficiency, the upper bound on the efficiency of any engine that runs between just two, temperature, uh, two heat baths of two different temperatures. That makes us happy as quantum steampunkers because if we broke the second law, something would be very wrong with what we had done. And again, we can I can show numerical simulation results if you're interested. The MBL mobile has a few advantages as a heat engine over some particular competitors. 
We've already seen that it scales robustly toward the thermodynamic limits because it's athermal in that it's localized. Particles don't spread out a whole lot. We've also seen that because of that scaling, it has a high power, relatively high power density. Also, suppose that you have an engine and you run it over many, many, many cycles. The amount of work that you'll extract will differ from cycle to cycle if you have a finite size system. The MBL mobile is relatively reliable. That the fluctuations in the work that you obtain from cycle to cycle are relatively small. That's because of the other a thermal property of many body localization. Namely, many body localized systems have energy gap statistics that are very unlike the energy gap statistics of a thermal phase. Those athermal energy gap statistics also give the MBL mobile relatively few worst case trials. In some trials, your engine might actually absorb a net positive amount of work instead of outputting a net positive amount of work. I call such a trial a worst case trial. There are relatively few of those in, as performed by our MBL mobile as compared to a certain competitor. But what is ahead for this field? Well, first, there are some opportunities created by the MBL mobile. The MBL mobile can be realized physically in experiments. People have been realizing many body localization and I'm currently working with collaborators on a superconducting qubit realization of the engine. The engine works, but it isn't optimal. Quantum thermodynamicists have come up with many tools for optimizing a quantum engine cycle. For, for example, a shortcut to adiabaticity can be used in the tuning stroke so that we don't have to tune the Hamiltonian so very slowly. This work demonstrated that many body localization as an athermal system can be regarded as a resource in one thermodynamic task, work extraction. But many other thermodynamic tasks exist. For instance, if you run an engine cycle backward, you can get a refrigerator. So we could imagine, since quantum engines tend to need to be at low temperatures, we could maybe imagine some quantum many body engine that refrigerates other quantum many body engines. Also, this work demonstrated that level statistics or energy gap statistics can be regarded as athermal resources in thermodynamic tasks. Usually, thermodynamicists think of probability distributions over phase space or density operators as things of the sort that can be athermal and so serve as resources in thermodynamic tasks. But also, energy gap statistics can be athermal different from in the thermal phase and can help us in a thermodynamic task. I imagine that there are other applications of athermal level statistics. And this also suggests maybe it's not just probability distributions, density operators, and energy gap statistics. Maybe there are other things that we haven't even thought of that can be regarded as athermal and resources. More broadly, I think that one of the biggest opportunities for quantum steampunk is for it to go outside and interact more with the neighbors. Quantum thermodynamics forms a rich landscape with many subfields in it and many toolkits and perspectives. It sits within an even broader landscape of other scientists who are interested from different perspectives in quantum physics, information, and energy. We can potentially take all our toolkits into other fields and answer pre-existing questions there, or we can discover new questions to ask about other fields. Also, people in other fields have developed great toolkits, theoretical and experimental, for probing quantum thermalization. So we can compare our toolkits, strengthen one with the other. There are some examples of these things happening. Also, I think it would be very nice to realize some of the promise within quantum thermodynamics of conventional thermodynamics. Conventional thermodynamics was very closely tied to technology, the steam engine, which has been extremely valuable and definitely worth investing in. Quantum thermodynamics has so far given us a lot of theory, a lot of insights, and a lot of fundamental insights. We've also proposed some what you could call technologies, such as the MBL mobile, but most of these aren't practical. It would be 
wonderful to be able to use quantum thermodynamics to come up with a technology really worth, worth investing in. Maybe not quite as transformational as the steam engine, but still closer to technology. In summary, we saw that quantum information theory can serve as a mathematical and conceptual toolkit for re-envisioning thermodynamics. Information and work can both serve as resources in computation and thermodynamics. We saw one example of a field under active work today, that of quantum many-body engines. And in particular, I introduced the MBL Mobile, a quantum many-body engine that can be ratcheted between a many-body localized regime and a more thermal regime. We saw that in a couple of ways, many-body localization makes a system athermal that we can use, and we can use this athermal, athermality to our advantage. We saw an auto cycle that this system can undergo. We calculated the power and efficiency and saw that the engine has a few advantages over particular competitors. Finally, we saw that there is much to be done. If you're hooked on any of these ideas, I can recommend some reading. These are two reviews about quantum thermodynamics. The field does move very quickly, so a fair amount has happened since then, but these provide a wonderful entree into the field and overview a number of subfields within quantum thermodynamics. I can also mention my PhD thesis, which I am proud of primarily because in it I was able to use the term quantum steampunk in actual scientific literature. And a more, let's say, more of a bedtime reading flavor piece of reading is in Scientific American. I was very grateful to be able to write an article for Scientific American about quantum steampunk that came out last spring. Again, quantum information theory is one of the rising technologies of the 21st century. We can use quantum information theory to revitalize the thermodynamics of the 1800s for the 21st century. And this combination is a fusion of old and new that I call quantum steampunk. So steampunk fans dream it, quantum information thermodynamicists live it. Thanks for your attention. Thank you for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, and it was really clear as well. So I think um, hopefully everyone in our audience will have um, got something from the talk from different backgrounds that they've come from. Um, and it was fun to have the steampunk uh, references throughout as well. Thank you. I'm glad. <laughs> um, so now we can have some uh, questions and answers. So um, you can feel free to put your questions in the Q and A um, section. There's a Q and A box on Zoom, and you can type your questions in there. Um, so we have some questions already. Um, so one question I was going to ask was how, um, in the description of the engine that you've been analysing, how are you defining? Um, heat and work in the engine. And I think it's related to um, a question in the Q&A from Jeffrey, who has said, what is the work done on and how could we conceivably get it out of the system? Sure. Let me bring up a few more slides. I might take a moment to find them. Okay. These questions tap into the question of just what are heat and work in quantum thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, we're used to thinking of a system of interest that exchanges energy with a heat bath and exchanges energy with what we can think of as a battery, something you would want to perform work on or draw work from. We say that the energy exchanged with the heat bath is called heat and the energy exchanged with the battery is called work. 
if we do quantum thermodynamics, then we can also have a system exchanging energy with a heat bath and with a battery, but it can be trickier to distinguish the heat from the work. We might expect to need to measure all the Hamiltonians in order to figure out how much energy was exchanged. And measuring a system can change the system. So we can actually perform work when trying to figure out how much work was done. Also, suppose that our state has coherences relative to an energy eigenbasis, then how do we even define the energy in a system? We can define the energy in terms of an expectation value, but an expectation value's operational significance is an average over trials, and we might want to know what's happening in this particular trial. Oh. All of these questions are very much debated within quantum thermodynamics. Many different people have many different definitions for heat and work. I'm of the opinion that different definitions are best suited to different situations. But here is one definition of heat and work that is often used in the context of slow processes. Let's call the internal energy of our system the trace of our system's Hamiltonian with its state. Suppose that the energy changes. There are two ways for it to change by the product rule. First, the state can change, and second, the Hamiltonian can change. The change of the states is the quantum analog of the change of the phase-based density in classical statistical mechanics. Imagine a classical statistical mechanical system exchanging a small system, exchanging energy with a heat bath. The phase-based density is going to change. And in particular, it's going to change to, its, to the, the thermal distribution, which has the maximum entropy of all the pro possible probability distributions that are consistent with the constraints on the system. So heat is associated with uncertainty because we said that how spread out our probability distribution is across space phase, phase space is correlated with how uncertain we are about which microstate the system ocup occupies. Now heat is random. It's associated with uncertain energy. It's energy that's not being controlled. We don't know it's exactly where the particles are moving. So it makes sense to think of this term as quantifying the heat flowing into the system. If the Hamiltonian is changing, then there's some classical external parameter in the Hamiltonian that is changing. And we tend to think of that classical external parameter as something controlled. So this term represents well-ordered energy. So we will often call it the work that's being performed on, on the system. So those are the definitions that we used for work and heat for our MBL mobile. We, there are a couple of different ways to calculate work and heat in quantum thermodynamics. One is called an implicit battery model. One is called an explicit battery model. We used an implicit battery model. So we didn't specify what form the battery has. We didn't include the, bat the battery explicitly in our model, but we said, look, the system of the, en the energy of the system is changing. It's changing in this way. It makes sense to think of this energy change as work. So this is the work being done on the system. How the banner battery manifests is going to differ from platform to platform. You could imagine running the engine cycle with a quantum many body system in a cavity. The cavity is going to have some electromagnetic field, mo field modes in it. The electromagnetic field modes can gain energy and lose energy. We can think of that change in energy as being due to the work that's being performed by the engine. Great, thank you. Um, so we have some more questions. One from Anthony LaMonica is asking, what is the me mechanical method of tuning the Hamiltonian? That also depends on which platform we're using. For instance, if we're using ultra cold atoms, then the external disorder might be imposed by the optical lattice, which is formed by propagating laser beams. And so we can change the parameters of the laser in order to change that disorder potential. Great, thanks. Um, and another question we have is from Vivek Kumar Tiwari, which is, um, uh, he says MBL here, ergo, this is broken and this is used as an advantage. 
Um, yes, I would say that's pretty accurate. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think it was more of a, a comment than, or maybe he was checking, um, yeah, checking the comment. Um, and another question we have is from Adam Brown, who says, what is a typical cycle time of an MBL? How critical is maintaining coherence within the engine? And is coherence time hard to manage? The time is something that's covered in our paper in detail. I didn't include that in the talk because the talk was mostly about quantum thermodynamics as a whole. But definitely, if we're thinking about the actual power, not just the work outputted by an average cycle, but the average work outputted per unit time, then we do need to think about the cycle time. We find, found that the limiting factor that determines our cycle time and determined how long our cycle needs to be was the thermalization with the cold bath. That takes the longest because the cold bath has a small bandwidth and we don't want for it to interact to non-locally cross the system so that the mesoscale engines remain somewhat independent. The, so there's a, a calculation of the cycle time in our paper. It's based primarily on Fermi's golden rule. And for an order of magnitude estimate, that, that will depend on the platform. But there is an order of magnitude estimate uh, near the end of our paper for the phosphorus doped silicon example. Great, thanks. Um, so just as a, as a final question, um, more broadly, you were talking about at the end about um, potential where the field could go in the future and um, potential applications. Um, are there any particular um, practical applications that you can imagine um, that you think would be the most interesting to come out from quantum thermodynamics or particular applications that you think would be um, yeah, good to come out from the field. Yeah, that is something that's hard to figure out because quantum systems tend to need to be in very, very special conditions in order to exhibit quantum behaviors. Um, so it, I think that the most important thing could, or one of the key steps could be finding a situation in which you have a quantum system already. So you have the right environment so that the system can exhibit quantum behavior you're primarily doing something else with the system, but it just so happens that um, you can sort of use a piece of this on the side to run some thermodynamic protocol. Maybe, you, maybe you're performing a computation and you have your entire lab set up to perform a computation because that's what you're committed to doing. But because of the way that heat is flowing in some part of it, you can set some little quantum engine there and it will on its own more or less pump out energy. So, finding some situation like that, I think would be valuable. Great, thanks. Um, we've also had a couple more questions come in. So um, a question from Amy Sell, um, have tools from quantum thermodynamics been used in concepts on the computer science side of quantum information tasks? For example, entropy is not usually discussed in quantum random access codes where information is extracted from qubits after it's been encoded by someone else. But Schumacher's theorem makes it seem like it should. There are definitely a lot of examples of concepts from information theory and computation being useful in quantum thermodynamics. As for going the other direction, uh, there are thermodynamic concepts that are useful in computation. And an interesting example is the case of Landauer erasure, how erasing in order to say, create some fiducial states of your qubits so that you can run a computation that costs thermodynamic work. There are some, there are other thermodynamic concepts more broadly that are usually not considered precisely within the purview of the field of quantum thermodynamics, even though they involve quantumness and thermodynamics, um, but that have cropped up maybe motivated by other fields that um, have been playing roles in quantum computation, or, you know, actually, I suppose I can give an example. Um, this is one that happens to be about some work of mine because it's, it's the, one of the examples I know best um, and so comes most easily to mind. I, let's see, there is a concept that's now important in quantum computation called scrambling. 
uh, suppose we have a quantum many body system and we perturb it a little, or we inject a little bit of information into it locally. If the system is interacting, that information, if the system is not many body localized, then the information can spread across the system through many body entanglement. Creating scrambled states is of interest to people building quantum computers, because if you have scrambled states, then you can perform some sampling tasks that uh, much more efficiently than you can with classical computers. So I, th there is a, there are a few me metrics for scrambling, and one of them is a particular correlator, a particular correlation function. I, at one point, felt that one should be able to derive a fluctuation relation for this correlation function. A uh, fluctuation relation is a concept from actually non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, but it's been incorporated into quantum thermodynamics. It's a strengthening of the second law of thermodynamics. So I ended up deriving a fluctuation relation that involved this concept of scrambling. And it ended up uncovering some unexpected features of scrambling that led to some proposals for measuring scrambling and some interesting insights we picked up along the way. So at least that's one example, and there can certainly um, there are certainly close connections between computation and quantum thermodynamics. Great, thanks. That's really interesting. The links with scrambling, um, and I think it might be related a bit to the last question we have from um, Prashant has asked: Are there other areas from physics where MBL is encountered, for example, black holes? Because he says I think you mentioned the black hole information paradox briefly. MBL has been of interest to different people in different fields. It's been of interest most to people in condensed matter and atomic molecular and optical physics. These are fields in which we can build those Hamiltonians that realize many body localization. But as I just mentioned, there's the concept of scrambling that's of interest in quantum computation. It's also very much of interest in the black hole information paradox because uh, black hole scrambles information very quickly. And we should know about scrambling if we want to figure out what happens to the information that goes into a black hole. So people have been, for instance, contrasting what happens with black holes with what happens under evolution in many body localized systems. So that at least offers a useful situation to contrast to. And people in these various communities are um, certainly noting the difference between how information spreads if the system is many body localized or if it's a fast scrambler. Great, thanks. Um, I think that's all our questions. Um, that was really interesting and the answers to the questions were as well. So thanks again for um, coming to give the talk and- um, Thanks very much for hosting me. You're welcome. Um, so just to finish off, thank you everyone for coming to, to watch the talk. Um, just as a side note, I think this is one of the, um, the events that's had the most response on Facebook that we've ever had on, um, in terms of responses to the event. There were over 600 people interested and I think we got about 75 came to the event today um, and hopefully the, the other 500 can watch on YouTube when it's um, put on online. Um, Good to hear. Yeah, I uh, hope to see everyone um, at our future events. We've got more events coming up in the next few weeks of this term. So you can like the Facebook page or um, and you can sign up to the mailing list where there's a link on our Facebook page to stay updated on the events. So thanks. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks very much.